the LCAC started uh, 50 years ago, really trying to have a voice for the arts community. At the time, there was a man named Jim Crockett who realized that every time someone put on an event, there was lack of support. So he realized that we needed to have some kind of an organization to band together and operate as a single voice. When I first moved to Livermore, I thought, my God, what am I doing here? It was, it was kind of a cow town, you know, and I was used to sort of an urban setting in the Northwest with lots of trees and foggy and overcast days. And here was Livermore, I thought it was a desert. And then I came downtown and we had one signal light. It was a flashing yellow. And it was run by uh, farmers and ranchers. And our mayor at that time was, uh, um, ran a barber shop. There was no cultural life that I can remember at all. But it wasn't long before I realized that at that time, I, Livermore was going through a state of flux. I read The Independent. There was a good writer talking about making an arts council happen in Livermore. I happened to know Don Miller because he was acting with cask and mask. So I called him up one time and said, I noticed these articles by Jim Crockett. What can we do to start an arts council? I think one would be great. There were five of us. Jim Crockett, Joan Seppola, Don Miller, Tanya Selden, Charles Speak. Between uh, April 1966 and June 1966, the Arts Livermore Cultural Arts Council was formed. A lot of emphasis was placed on the arts festival. The symphony played in the tent for one of the arts festivals. There were boards on the ground because it had been raining and the ground was wet. You could walk to the symphony. They played waltzes. Some of us danced. And this was noted by certain reporters in The Independent who reported that people were dancing in the aisles. And I thought that was fun. Rad Lab opened, and my goodness, there was suddenly we were flooded with uh, PhDs, and they didn't marry dummies, so they had a lot of dynamite women came with them. So we ended up with a lot of little organizations forming, like the Painters of the Artist Society, and, and uh, along the line, why, we formed a, a theatrical group called the Cask and Mask. And it started out pretty much as just reading to each other from scripts. And it evolved over time. And first, I guess our first play was Blythe Spirit. And that must have been in the late 50s. And it just progressed. And uh, we actually put on a lot of good plays over the years. And uh, quite diverse, too. We did everything from Moliere to uh, Gilbert and Sullivan. And, a lot of pop boilers too, of course, you know, like you can't take it with you. The Exiles, we did that here. And I, it's probably the only time anybody ever did it in the Western Hemisphere. We're kind of proud of that one. And then Tennessee Williams, we did the Glass Menagerie. Connie Duke was in that. She was marvelous as a Southern woman. <laughs> it's the scandal, dear madam, is the offense. And it's no sin to sin in confidence. We knew we needed a, needed a place to meet. And um, at that time, we thought, well, gee, wouldn't it be nice to have a theater? The barn, as people refer to it, is uh, basically an old structure built in 1918 right after World War I, and it, and it housed the army, I think it was cavalry at the time. Well, I, there was a lady, Ann Wieskamp, 
And she said, we really hate to see that barn torn down. Can you get some folks together and see if we can resurrect this thing? I knew that we'd have to satisfy a lot of building codes. So I gathered about, I think, 40 people together. And one of the guys I can think of immediate was Jim Doggett. And we started something called the A-Crew. And the A-Crew was a bunch of ragtags. We were all hands-on people. And so we had meetings deciding how to do it. One of the things that was hard to do was to find out how to get the machinery out here through the corporation yard of the city. Well, here again, I mean, shouldn't admit this, but we had a friend. And this friend magically produced the key for us, which permitted the thing to get started. And we discovered there wasn't any water. Well, that was not going to be an impediment for us. The barn was right next to the new library. So where do you suppose we got the water? So we dug a trench and put the pipe in. And um, so at one of the city council meetings, they said, well, you can't really do this. You don't have water. And I, I said, well, I said, if you go out and look, there really is water. And uh, the next thing we needed was heaters. Well, we didn't have enough money to buy new heaters, so when I was working at the lab, I saw them tear down a building, and I went to the people, and uh, I said, you know, what are you going to do with those heaters? He said, probably dump them. And so I said, well, um, do you know that if you go out to Pacific Avenue, there's a place called a barn, and in the middle of the floor, there's a present. So we would greatly appreciate if you go and have a look at that present. So that evening I came back and the heaters were there and the beer was gone. There was a guy by the name of B.B. who was in charge of the PG&E office at the time. And I rung him in on it. I said, you know, we need some wire. And he said, do you believe in fairies? And I said, well, yeah, I believe in fairies. He said, well, something might happen. So the next morning I woke up ready to go to work and there was this huge reel of wire in my driveway. Well, I guess the good fairy did come after all. We decided that we're going to have an Oktoberfest, that we call it the Summerfest. And by gosh, it was a huge success and it carried on for many years. societal things that kind of happened was that Sterling Colgate became a member of the board of directors of the park district and he came up with this brilliant idea I thought to get us in the May school which was at that time was wasn't being used for anything in the uh, uh, park district somehow they managed to get a hold of it so we turned that one room schoolhouse into a, a, a really a delightful little theater lasted quite a while and it was full of really good stuff like all of our costumes and our sets and it was allure I think anyway somewhere along the line why some vandals got in and burned it down and that was pretty much the end of cast and mask and uh, from there on it was just trying to find a place to put a show on In the early 90s, LCAC began to think about a performing arts center in the valley and a facility to meet in. And we decided uh, that what we would like to do is to make this a valley-wide performing arts center. And I wrote a letter to the mayor of Livermore at the time, who was Dale Turner, 
asking the city to take the lead in getting this performing arts center going. City council met, discussed it, and decided to do it. So they became the lead. And then they formed uh, a city committee just to represent Livermore, and I was on that committee. And each of the cities in, in the valley, Pleasanton and Dublin, and also the college, um, had their own committees. But later, when we decided who to hire, the two of them backed out. And the city of Livermore and the college system couldn't afford to do it by themselves, so that was dropped. But that really stimulated a lot of interest among a lot of people, particularly in the LCAC, but also in the art community in Livermore, to go further with this. And then I got a call from Joan Seppola one day. She became interested in it. It turns out that the city had an ad hoc committee involved in planning for the downtown improvement through the redevelopment agency. And I started going to their committee meetings and they made me secretary of this. So that's the way things really got started. And we got far enough along in that to eventually Joan Phil Wente and I decided that we ought to have a corporation because we needed funding. Scott Haggerty managed to approve dedicating some of the money from the Altamont Wasteville to the Performing Arts in Livermore. A fraction of the money collected for dumping waste supported the arts. Okay, here we go. How about Playboy of the Western World? Yeah. My name is Michael James O'Flaherty, and you'd have me taking a stroll through the snooks of the red woman with a drop taken? Oh, no. the kind of people that are here. They have traditionally not taken what the easy path is. We have a, a wide variety. Most of the groups are, you would say, of the performing arts. Then there's the visual arts, public institutions, and there are other cultural organizations. Having a voice that's larger than any one group really is a strong part of LCAC. We were able to start up what we referred to at the time as Tuesday Tunes, and that was a great opportunity to introduce music and culture and arts and LCAC to the community.
we have seen very clearly is that all of the groups that I'm aware of, as they've come into this building, have pushed up their act. I think uh, Saturday night is a great example. There's Judy Collins singing and the Livermore Amador Orchestra doing something that they couldn't have begun to do 10, 10 years ago. You know, uh, you know, basically perform with a world-class professional it was a special event. I think it, it shows that, that we've merged the resident companies with these world-class artists in a way that, that Phil and Joan and other people really wanted it to, to work. Thank you.